Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas is the cult classic turned holiday favorite that has fans celebrating non-stop from Halloween to Christmas Eve, and the movie is filled with freaky and fascinating goodies. Let's scare up a few secrets. Want to peek at some characters you know and love? When Jack um, gives Santa a break and goes out on Christmas Eve to deliver gifts to all the good boys and girls, pay attention to the little kiddo's pajamas. The brother and sister duo are wearing pajamas with a very famous mouse and duck on them. It's Disney's Mickey and Donald. Here's another Mickey sighting. Like the hidden Mickey at the beginning of Monsters, Inc., this one comes in the form of a Mickey hat, and you can find it just above the book on the right as Jack is hard at work conducting his Christmas experiments. Another classic Disney character makes a brief cameo during the town meeting. After Jack exclaims, listen everyone, watch the next shot as the last of the, uh, townsfolk get seated. Look in the back row on the right and you'll see a familiarly shrouded lady holding an apple. This is the evil queen in disguise from Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, Burton style. Can't get enough of those fairy tale cameos? Well, the Wolfman has a supporting role and can be seen around town throughout the movie. But did you catch the hat he's wearing after Santa leaves Halloween Town with the gift of snow? It's like the old granny hat made famous in so many illustrations of the Big Bad Wolf after he disguises himself as granny to trick Little Red Riding Hood. This next easter egg is an homage to a deep cut character created by Tim Burton. When Igor brings Dr. Finkelstein the plans for Jack's reindeer, the doctor rewards him with a doggy treat, but not just any doggy treat. Look at the picture on the label and you'll see a pup with sutures across his head, just like Frankenweenie, aka Sparky from Tim Burton's 1984 live action short film Frankenweenie. Burton would later give his pup the stop motion treatment in the 2012 feature length movie of the same name. But the most beloved dog in Halloween Town just has to be Jack's ghost dog, Zero. And with a nose that glows so bright, just like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, it's as if he was made to help Jack take control of Christmas. But really study that nose of his. It's not red, but orange. And it's not just a light, it's a jack-o'-lantern. Looking for other eerie sights? At the beginning of the Making Christmas number, feast your eyes on the sewing machine Sally uses and you'll realize that the thread is actually webbing being pulled from a spider. Also, during the Making Christmas number, while the ghouls are creating the makeshift track for the mayor and his snowmobile, keep your eye on the cyclops as the box passes in front. Now you see him, now you don't. Spooky effect. The mind of producer Tim Burton seems just chock full of offbeat creativity. Where does he get his crazy ideas? Well, in the case of The Nightmare Before Christmas's main character Jack Skellington, you need to look no further than Burton's fiendishly fun film Beetlejuice, which came out five years before. Watch the scene where Winona Ryder's Lydia conjures the mischievous Beetlejuice in order to save her ghostly friends Barbara and Adam. Beetlejuice, played by Michael Keaton, rises out of Adam's town model wearing a creepy circus-like umbrella hat. Take a look at the tippy top of the hat. See anything familiar? That's because you're looking at the skull that inspired Jack, along with a bat which would later serve as his bow tie. There's a little wink at Beetlejuice in The Nightmare Before Christmas, emphasis on little. Watch the end of Lock, Shock, and Barrel's song, Kidnap the Sandy Claws. We see Oogie Boogie's shadow and he throws a pair of red dice. Take a close look at the snake crawling in and out of the dice spots. Its striped skin and long mouth might just conjure up memories of the sandworm Gina Davis's Barbara rides to gobble Beetlejuice up. Maybe this is what they look like when they're babies. Did you know that Catherine O'Hara, who plays Lydia's mom in Beetlejuice, is the voice of Sally? Dr. Finkelstein's creation, who has a soft spot for the tall and bony Jack? Sally, in the tradition of the Frankenstein monster, is sewn and patched together from scraps. One interesting detail, take a look at her eyelashes. They're not eyelashes at all, but bandage sutures sewn into her eyelids. If that wasn't creepy enough, did you happen to notice Dr. Finkelstein's wheelchair? The canvas part of the chair also seems to be stapled, stretched, and stitched just like Sally. We dare not ask what material he used. Catherine O'Hara isn't the only transplant from Beetlejuice. Glenn Shaddix, who played Otho in that movie, voices the mayor of Halloween Town. One of the interesting details regarding his physical appearance is the fact that he has two faces. On one side, he's got a happy face. On the other side, his face is anxious. I guess you could say the symbolism of a two-faced politician is a little on the nose. There are three more characters that share another face-based easter egg. Lock, Shock, and Barrel are the three most famous trick-or-treaters in Halloween Town. Did you see how their faces aren't really any less bizarre than the masks they wear? That's because the filmmakers are referencing a classic episode of a TV show called The Twilight Zone. In the episode called The Masks, the characters take off their masks to reveal 
that their faces are almost exactly as grotesque as the masks they wear. Locke is voiced by Paul Rubens, who shot into the stratosphere as Pee Wee Herman in another Tim Burton classic, Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Shock is actually voiced by our Sally, Catherine O'Hara, and Beryl is voiced by Danny Elfman, another longtime collaborator with Burton and the singing voice of Jack Skellington. Did you know that Danny Elfman is responsible for all the music in the movie? He's been an accomplished composer for over 40 years, and he found that writing the 10 songs for The Nightmare Before Christmas was one of the easiest jobs he ever had because he felt he had so much in common with Jack Skellington, naturally. Another claim to fame is his work with the American New Wave band Oingo Boingo, who pushed out a couple of bangers in the 80s, including the song Weird Science, which accompanied the movie of the same name. But the band is also known for the Halloween hit Dead Man's Party, so I guess you could say that Halloween runs in his blood. Danny Elfman might sing the part of Jack Skellington, but his likeness can actually be found in another character in the movie. Remember the band that Jack tries to teach Christmas music to? In one of the stranger character designs, the band leader who directs the group seems to be either a part of or trapped inside the upright bass. His features are modeled after the red-haired maestro himself. Elfman isn't the only actor to bring Jack Skellington to life. When Jack's not singing, his voice is performed by actor Chris Sarandon, who is also no stranger to the horror genre, thanks to his turn as Jerry Dandridge, the neighborhood vampire in the 80s scarer Fright Night. However, most people would recognize him as the conniving buffoon Prince Humperdinck from the fairy tale classic The Princess Bride. Sarandon was chosen for Skellington because his speaking voice matched Danning Elfman's singing voice so well. The illusion is sonically seamless, so much so that Elfman tends to garner most of the accolades for Jack. Gotta give Chris Sarandon his due, though. There's another person involved in the movie that tends to be overshadowed, this time by the visionary Tim Burton. Did you know that Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas isn't directed by Tim Burton? Though the story was created from a poem penned by Burton, directing credit actually goes to Henry Selleck, who also directed James and the Giant Peach and Coraline. Speaking of James and the Giant Peach, did you know that Jack Skellington makes an appearance? He plays the captain of the ghost ship in the icy waters. As for Coraline, Jack Skellington makes a cameo in that movie too, sort of. Blink and you'll miss it, but when Other Mother cracks an egg over the bowl, pause real fast when you see the whole yolk and you'll be rewarded by seeing that the yolk is the same shape as Jack Skellington's head. So, why isn't it called Tim Burton and Henry Selleck's The Nightmare Before Christmas? Well, in Hollywood, that can always get a little tricky. In most cases, movies are actually owned by the producers or studios that put the money up to get the movie made. In the case of certain big-name directors or directors with a specific style, the movie might come to be considered theirs in name only, but sometimes more depending on their contracts. So, what happened here? To hear Selleck tell it, he's not at all bothered. He said, it's as though he, Burton, laid the egg, and I sat on it and hatched it. He wasn't involved in a hands-on way, but his hand is in it. It was my job to make it look like a Tim Burton film, which is not so different from my own films. Burton, for his part, wishes that Selleck's name was more recognized for the movie. Though Nightmare is Burton's brainchild and he served as producer, did you know that he only spent 8 to 10 days being present during the making of the movie? This is because he was directing two other movies on either side of the film, Batman Returns in 1992 and Ed Wood in 1994. Batman Returns may have rubbed off a little on The Nightmare Before Christmas. During Jack's song What's This in Christmas Town, there are many aspects of Christmas that Jack doesn't recognize or understand. But did you notice that he was familiar with mistletoe? That's because mistletoe is a poisonous plant if you eat it, a fact Burton fans heard in Batman Returns twice, spoken by Batman and Catwoman, and then again by the same characters as their alter egos Selina Kyle and Bruce Wayne, revealing their true identities. That's not the only Batman reference in the movie. Remember when Jack gathers everyone for a town meeting to talk about Christmas Town? The mayor opens up a spotlight to help Jack with his presentation, and when he does, bats fly out of it. This is a wink at the famous bat signal, which shows up at the end of Tim Burton's 1989 Batman, a movie that helped pave the way for the cinematic Batman you've come to know and love today. The Nightmare Before Christmas has become such a classic over the years, Jack and the town even take over the Disney theme parks during the holiday season. So when's the sequel coming out? There are at least four or five holidays Tim Burton can play with. And well, as it turns out, Tim doesn't want to make a sequel. According to the creator, I was always very protective of Nightmare not to do sequels or things of that kind. You know, Jack visits Thanksgiving World or other kinds of things just because I felt the movie had a purity to it. 
So it sounds like as far as he's concerned, why mess with a good thing? Still, if you want to know what happens to Jack and Sally after the movie, all you need is the soundtrack album. Did you know that they recorded an extended ending to the film and produced it on the soundtrack? In it, Santa Claus returns to Halloween Town years later for a visit, and when he does, he finds that Jack and Sally have four or five skeleton children. So that's great news to hear, especially coming from the mouth of narrator Patrick Stewart. I hope you liked the video and found some things you missed the first time in Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas. Make sure you subscribe to Movie Logic for more daily movie facts, trivia, and Easter eggs.